This video is about the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, or what our textbook authors call the second fundamental theorem of calculus, or I'll just abbreviate that FTC part two. Um, it says that if f is a continuous function on an open interval i, and that interval contains the value x equals a, then for every x in that interval, the derivative of this is equal to this. Now, almost every time I teach this, students get confused by this right here. Let's focus in on this expression in brackets. This is not a number. Um, this is actually, it's an area under the curve, but that area is changing. This is actually a function of x. So I want to think of this as a function of x. What we have here right here is the area under the curve given by y equals f of t. And they're just introducing this new variable t because they're using x for something else. So you've got y versus t, and maybe y equals f of t looks like this. And at t equals a, we're right here. And then we're saying at some other t value, and usually that t value over here is greater than a. So let's say that at t equals x. This is the value of f of x. This is the area under that curve. That's f of x. That's the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Now as x increases, that area is increasing. So uh, sometime later, f of x is going to be this area. At when this upper limit is a, we have the integral from a to a of f of t dt and we get zero. So that, so this is sort of an area function, but it's accumulating area the whole time. So as uh, this variable x increases, that area is getting larger and larger, um, provided that that function f is continuous on that open interval containing a. So as long as this function continues to be continuous, we can keep going and going and going and we can find this, this area that's increasing. And so now we've got area as a function of x. As t increases, um, or as this upper bound increases and that's, that upper bound is given by x, that area increases. Um, what the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says is that that area, if I take the, the rate of change of this function, so that's that accumulated area function right here. Um, if I take the derivative of that with respect to x, so I'm saying how does that change as x changes by a little bit? Well, it turns out um, to give you the integrand back, which seems sort of magical um, in some ways, or it seems very obvious in other ways. Um, but it's it's not 100% clear why the instantaneous rate of change of this accumulating error, this error, area function, excuse me, um, the instantaneous rate of change of this would give you this back, but it does. And it sort of reminds you of a derivative of an antiderivative. That's not exactly what it is here, but it reminds you of that. Because we, you know if we were to take the derivative of an antiderivative, well, that should give me the function back. Um, and if there were no bounds here and that was an f of x and that was a dx, then yeah, that would make sense. The derivative of the antiderivative is this. But somehow we're saying that sort of still works with a definite integral. Um, but now instead of having f of t, I get f of x back. It's very strange. I'm going to prove this to you and then we'll use the second part of the fundamental theorem. Um, to prove the first part of the fundamental theorem, but I'm going to do that in a separate video. In this video, we're just going to apply this. Um, we'll apply this with composite functions as well, so there will be a chain rule version of this. Um, and then we'll talk about this thing that seems so magical. Um, it's, it's, it's actually pretty cool um, how that works. <coughs> but I will show you the proof in another video. So for right now, let's just apply this. Let's say somebody gives you this function. So you're given that f of x is the integral from 1 to x 
of t squared over t squared plus one dt. And you're asked to find f prime. Well, all they're asking you to do is find the derivative of this. Oops, there should be a dt over there. Okay, now according to our theorem, the way this works is you, if you have a constant here and a variable x there and an f of t dt right here, it's like we're taking the antiderivative or the derivative of an antiderivative, but we're not. Somehow, it's not that it represents this area. It turns out, according to the second part of the fundamental theorem, what you get is that f of t, but you replace the t with an x. So you just write down f of t, and you replace the t with an x. That's it. That's what the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says. So you're writing the original integrand but we replace the t with an x. Okay. So that's just a straightforward application of the rule. Let's do one where we can actually evaluate it either way. Let's say we're given the um, function f of x is the integral from uh, 0 to x of cosine of t dt. Well, let's think about what that represents. And then we're asked to find um, f prime of x. Let's think about what that represents, and then we'll evaluate this derivative two ways. In one way, we'll evaluate the antiderivative, plug in the bounds, and then take the derivative. And the other way, we'll just apply the rule. Um, so first, let's visualize this. Well, it's the area between the function and the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals x. So cosine looks like this, and it repeats. That's pi over 2, even though it doesn't look like it. So our function f of x is giving us this area here. We start at 0, and we go out to x. And then when x equals pi over 2, we get that area. And when x is, let's say, uh, 3 pi over 4, we get this area minus this area. And when x is pi, we get that area minus that area. I think I'd expect to get 0. Those look like they're symmetric. When x is 5 pi over 4, we get this area minus this area. That area looks like it's more than that area, so I think it would be negative. So f is taking on all these values. Um, it's initially has a zero area, and then that area starts increasing until it gets to this maximum value. And then we start subtracting areas. And we're subtracting and subtra subtracting and subtracting until we get over here. Then we start adding area. And we keep going, but this is giving us that net area from x equals zero to whatever this x value is right here. So that's what f of x represents. Now, if I want to find f prime, we can do it two ways. Method number one, we just apply that second fundamental theorem of calculus. We say f prime of x is the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 0 to x of cosine of t dt. Well, according to our theorem, we just identify f of t. It's right there. 
and then you replace the T with an X. So we just get cosine. And instead of having cosine of T, we get cosine of X. That's one way. Okay. It's like we're taking the antiderivative or the derivative of the antiderivative and somehow we get that back, but that's not what this is. This is an area, which is different. Okay. It's a good memory device. This derivative of the antiderivative gives me the function back, but it's not exactly what's happening. So you got to be careful about using that memory device. Got to remember that it's not quite right. Method number two, we can actually evaluate this integral. So we'll evaluate the definite integral using the first part of the fundamental theorem. And then we'll differentiate the result. That is probably more comfortable for most of us. Like this feels like magic. I feel like I'm following a rule, but it doesn't really make sense yet because we haven't proved it yet, but we'll prove it, prove it in a different video. Okay, so let's just evaluate this integral first. We've got the integral from zero to x of cosine of t dt. The first thing you do is you take the antiderivative. The antiderivative of cosine of t is sine of t and you plug in zero and x and subtract. So you've got sine of x minus sine of zero. And of course, sine of zero is zero. So f of x turns out to be sine of x. That's actually kind of cool. It makes sense. We start with zero area, and then our area increases, and I think it's going to increase until we get to one. And then it starts decreasing until it gets back down to zero, and then it goes to negative one then it increases again, I think that's pretty cool. So f of x is sine of x. Now if I take the derivative of sine of x, then I get cosine back. So if you actually think about this operation, this rule makes a lot more sense. What do we do? First we take the antiderivative of the function. Then we plug in the upper bound and lower bound and subtract. If that upper bound has an x in it, and that lower bound has a constant, it's gone. So you took the antiderivative and you got this. And then you took the derivative of the results. Well, what's the derivative of the antiderivative? It should be the original function, but instead of having a t now, it has an x because you replaced the t with x when you plugged in that upper bound. So I think this makes sense and it makes this rule make a lot more sense. Because first you take the antiderivative, then you plug in an x, and then you take the derivative, and the derivative of the antiderivative is the original function, but evaluated at x. Okay, um, so that's that. That's how we do that one right there. Now, if the bounds are in a different order, if you don't have a constant to x here, but you have maybe x to a constant, or if you have a different function inside, instead of an x as your upper or lower bound of integration, um, you might have a function of x, then this changes just a little bit. So let's do another one. Let's say that f of x is equal to the integral. Um, let's just do a simple one. Um, from x to a zero of, let's say, the um, arc sine of t. Well, in order to use that second part of the fundamental theorem, I need the x to be the upper bound. So I just flip it and I multiply by negative one. And then if I wanna take the derivative, I'm taking the derivative of negative one times this integral. So I can fact factor out that negative. 
And so we would get the antiderivative of arc sine of t. We evaluated x, we evaluate at zero, and then we differentiate with respect to x. That's going to give us negative arc sine of x. Exactly the same function, but you replace the t with an x, according to the second part of the fundamental theorem. OK. Now the question becomes, well, how does this change if we don't put an x inside, but maybe we um, substitute a function inside? So let's say somebody asks you to find the derivative with respect to x of this. You've got the integral from 3x to sine of x of the square root of t dt. Well, I cannot use this in this form. I can't use the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus in this form, but I do have some properties for integrals that will allow me to rewrite this. Um, and I can also just anti-differentiate, um, use the, fundamental, the first part of the fundamental theorem to evaluate this, and then take the derivative. So let's do that, and then let's think about how the result we get, um, like how it might generalize. Okay, so, so I've got that and I'm asked to find f prime of x. Well, one way to do it is just to evaluate that integral and then differentiate. So we will Try that. So we're evaluating f using the first part of the fundamental theorem. And then we'll differentiate the result. OK. The first part of the fundamental theorem says, well, first let's rewrite that. That's a t to the one half power. First things first, you anti differentiate. So you add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. Then you substitute in the lower limit and the upper limit and you subtract. So we've got two thirds times sine of x to the 3 halves, and you could call that sine to the 3 halves x if you prefer, minus 2 thirds of 3x to the 3 halves. And that could be simplified, but let's not, because we're trying to, to see, try to infer a pattern here. OK, so that's f of x. And now let's take its derivative. Well, the derivative of this, according to the chain rule, is 2 over 3 times that exponent, 3 over 2, times the function to the 1 less power. So put your inside function back inside, and then you multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. So that's that right there. The 3's reduce, the 2's reduce, and you just get this square root of sine of x times the derivative of the inside, which is cosine of x. That's that first term. And then for this one, we bring that 2 thirds down, then we bring that 3 halves down. Got to use the chain rule as well. Multiply by that expression to the 1 half power. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. Derivative of 3x is 3 by the chain rule. And so what do we get? You get the square root of 3x multiplied by a 3. Now let's think about that second part of the fundamental theorem. When it's just an x here, all we do is we take that integrand and we replace it with an x and we're done. Now I've got a sine of x here. Did I just take the integrand and replace it with a sine of x? I didn't. 
I replaced it with a sine of x and I multiplied by the derivative of the inside. And then this was on the bottom. Somehow I replaced that with a 3x and multiplied by the derivative of the inside. Um, so I think I see a generalization um, coming just from pattern recognition. Okay, so that is one way to find f prime. Let's, let's use the second way to find f prime. So we will use properties of integrals. to rewrite f and use the second part of the fundamental theorem and the chain rule to evaluate it, to evaluate that derivative. So f of x is the integral from 3x to sine of x of the square root of t uh, with respect to t. Um, so I could rewrite this as a sum as long as I pick an x value or a t value that's in between this 3x and that sine of x. You can really pick any t value you want. Um, it just has to be a t value in the domain of this function. So I guess this is only well defined for t greater than zero. So I'll assume that um, Let's say t equals 1 is in between these two guys. Maybe 3x is less than 1. So we've got 3x over here, and there's a 1 there, and then there's a sine of x over here. And x equals 0 is somewhere over here on the number line. OK, well then, I could rewrite this this way. This is the integral from 3x to 1 of the square root of t plus the integral from 1 to sine of x of the square root of t. And this looks like a good candidate for the second part of the fundamental theorem. It has a sine of x instead of an x, but I can work with that because I've got the chain rule. Now this one doesn't quite look right. I need to have this 3x up there in order to use that second part of the fundamental theorem, so I will flip it. I'll do that. Now I can use the second part of the fundamental theorem for that, and I can use the second part of the fundamental theorem for this piece. And I think I want to put that one first. Okay, so now we're going to take the derivative of this using the fundamental theorem and the chain rule. So f prime of x is the derivative with respect to x of this first integral minus the derivative with respect to x of the second integral. Well, if that was just an x, I would get square root of x. But since I have a sine of x, I get square root of that inside function times the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And the derivative of the inside is cosine of x. And then over here, it's a composite function. That's my inside function. This is also an inside function. So when I take the derivative of this with respect to x, I get the square root of that inside function times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of that piece is 3. Well, isn't that the same result that I got up here? Get the square root of sine of x times derivative of the inside, square root of 3x times the derivative of the inside. It, it sure is. And remember where that derivative of the inside came from. It came from differentiating this using the chain rule. The derivative of this antiderivative 
gave me this function evaluated at the upper limit times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of this part gave me well, that function or this function evaluated at that limit times the derivative of the inside. Um, so, so this step here makes sense. Um, it's consistent with what we did over there. Okay, so I have not proven this yet, but we will prove it in a different video. This is the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus or what our textbook authors are calling the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And they say if, if f is continuous on an open interval containing t equals or x equals a, then for every x in that interval, this is representing an area under the curve starting at t equals a and going to t equals x. It's the area under the curve for y equals f of t. That's a function of x. As x increases, we get more and more area. If we take, if we look for the instantaneous rate of change of that area as x changes, it turns out you get the integrand back, but instead of having a t there, you're gonna have an x. And I think this example makes it clear why. We take the antiderivative, we plug in x, we plug in zero, and then we take the derivative of that result. Um, so actually, let's, let's write this out. Um, I can't use capital F though. So I have the integral from zero to x of f of t dt, and we'll get some antiderivative. Ooh, I hate that I've already used that f for something else. <coughs> the antiderivative of this. Well, I guess we could call it f of x. And we'll evaluate that from zero to a, or zero to x. Oops. And f of t. Man, I'm just butchering this right now. It's getting too late. It's getting so late that I'm getting really bad at this. Okay. This is what I'm trying to do. Let's look at the integral from a to x of f of t dt. First thing we do is take the antiderivative, and you should still have a t there. Then you replace um, t with x and t with a, and you subtract, and you get this. Now let's take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. Well, what ends up happening is you end up taking the derivative of the antiderivative and the derivative of the antiderivative gives you the function back, except now that it's evaluated at x, you get f of x instead of f of t. And that's just a constant, so the derivative of that piece is zero. Okay, so I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so that's that. That's the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus.